uh, thank you very much. Um, this evening was actually billed um, as a dog and pony show. Um, I'm the dog. Um, the, <laughs> um, the pony was to be Rod Yeager, and um, when we were discussing this um, last week, uh, we agreed that I would do a general introduction, uh, which I thought I might be able to manage, and he'll talk about the flowers, which he could do far more authoritatively than I can. Um, but um, sadly, um, Rod is in Louisiana bass fishing, um, so <laughs> um, I will do my best. Um, I'm a lawyer. Um, I'm retired. I like taking photographs. Um, when I told my parents um, that I was working on a book um, of, about wildflowers, um, if they were standing up, they would undoubtedly have fallen over. <laughs> um, they, they could not have been more surprised. Um, I owe uh, several debts. Um, perhaps the principal one um, is to my wife Sharon here, um, who's been a long-standing um, environmentalist, environmental teacher. And we would go out on um, hikes around Garland Ranch and other places, and I'd take my camera and I'd photograph this pretty flower. And I'd say, Sharon, what is it? And she would say, it's this, that, or the other. And over time, I developed um, a reasonable collection um, and had no idea what half of them were. And that was when I actually was um, told about Rod's uh, website, which was enormously helpful um, in identifying um, these beautiful flowers that I'd been photographing. And then as time passed and I got more photographs, I thought, well, why is there no book available um, to guide idiots such as me um, and help us um, identify all these beautiful things? And then I thought, well, maybe we should, we should actually put one together. And I approached Rod um, about a year ago, and he said, um, and I won't try and do his accent, um, which would be a great relief for my wife. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that sounds like a, a great idea. Let's do it. And um, so that was the, the genesis um, of the, um, the book, which uh, um, I have here. Um, and it's a, an illustrated guide to about 350 species at Garland Ranch. Garland Ranch is about 3,500 acres. Um, it's an interesting part because there's the, the Carmel River runs along the, um, the northern boundary, and then you have a riparian sort of plain, and then you have um, oak woodland ascending fairly steeply to some grasslands, and then further up um, through um, um, sagebrush and chaparral um, up to the ridges where you have open grassland. Um, we even have a little redwood canyon and some creeks running through it. So there are a lot of very diverse habitats um, within um, the one park. And there are about 525 species um, in Garland Ranch um, as a whole, which is about 25% of everything that's available in Monterey, which is, as you obviously know, a, a large and very diverse county. So Garland Ranch is an interesting place. Um, the slides I'm going to show you are overwhelmingly from Garland Ranch, um, but there are a few outliers um, that I thought it might be interesting to see. Um, but I thought we should start. Um, I'm sorry. I need to just uh, change one thing, if I can. Um, that's more like it. Um, I thought I'd start with the beginning of the year, and um, a very, very common, um, uh, beautiful um, flower here, milk maids or the California toothwort. Um, and just a little digression. Um, I'd thought for quite a while that um, when a plant was a wort, tooth wort, wound wort, fig wort, or whatever, it indicated some sort of medicinal use. What I hadn't appreciated that this all goes back um, to the doctrine of signatures. And this has a very, very ancient history, uh, right back to ancient Greek times. Um, and in the, um, Christian times, it was based on the idea that um, God has created these plants um, that can help us get well or avoid sickness. And to guide us in the choice of plants, he's made them look like whatever it is that's wrong. <laughs> um, that part of the body. So um, the toothwort um, 
supposedly has some teeth, um, I think, on the, the root. Um, but if you just look at the petals, doesn't that look like a nice shiny white tooth that any dentist would be proud of? Um, and uh, it is supposedly um, you know, quite good if you have a toothache. But anyway, that's toothwort. Um, woundwort is fairly self-explanatory. Figwort, which we'll come to a bit later, um, has always amused me. Um, because what is a fig? I know what a tooth is, I know what a wound is, um, but what's a fig? Um, and the answer is fig is an old English term for hemorrhoids. <laughs> um, another early um, spring flower, a, a very beautiful um, a, a borage, is the hound's tongue, the western hound's tongue. Um, and the plant's name appears to derive from the shape of the leaf, which looks like um, a lolling um, tongue, a dog's tongue. And it has these um, rather interesting, almost burr-like seeds. Um, the clasping Venus looking glass, um, I, I should just explain the order of these slides for the most part uh, follow the order of our book, which um, for the layman was um, color-coded, so we had blue, then pink, um, then white, and then yellow. And within each color, it's ordered by, um, by family, and then by uh, genus. So this is why we jump straight to the clasping Venus looking glass. Clasping because the, the leaves um, which are hard to see, um, are sort of clasping. But why Venus looking glass? And the best explanation I've come up with, in fact, the only explanation I've come up with, is that the seeds um, apparently are very, very um, small and very shiny, uh, which makes me conclude that Venus must have been very, very small indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it makes no sense to me at all. But it's a lovely flower, um, uh, the uh, Campanula. Um, lupin, yellow bush lupin, of course, um, we find um, everywhere. Um, yellow bush lupin, tree lupin. Along the coast, what we find overwhelmingly is the yellow version. As we move inland, um, we find the, um, the pink, um, pale purple version. Um, and rarely do we find the yellow. But a, a very attractive lupin forming quite big bushes. Um, and sometimes confused, but shouldn't be, with the next one, which is the silver bush lupin. Um, you, you don't really see it in this picture, but the leaves um, are a definite sort of silvery gray, which um, gives it its name. And the flowers, um, for the most part, are um, a, a much deeper purple. If Rod were here, he could give you a detailed discourse on the difference um, of the keels um, of all the various lupins and how the cilia the shape of the cilia varies from um, one to the other, but um, I, I don't feel competent to do that, so I'm going to um, <laughs> just leave you with the pretty pictures. Um, sky lupin, of course, um, um, is very, very well known. And there, if you go along the 68 corridor from Salinas to Monterey um, in the late spring, you often see the hillsides just covered with sky lupin. It's, it's the most glorious sight. Last year was a wonderful year for it. This year, sadly, um, has been rather less good. Um, the stinging lupin, um, very pretty, um, pink, not always quite as pink as this, but um, this is not an, an uncommon color. Um, but the, the leaves are rather nasty. They, oh, sorry, wrong, wrong button. Um, they have a, a sort of blistered appearance, and if you grasp or grasp the stem, um, you will get stung, and um, it's, it's not, not very pleasant. So on to something nicer, um, the baby blue eyes. Um, this picture makes it look a little pink in the middle, which um, it isn't, um, but it's a most um, lovely flower, growing sometimes in really quite large patches, um, and it has a white um, variant um, that we find not uncommonly. Um, fiesta flower, um, a much deeper sort of pinkish purple, and this is sometimes known as the Velcro flower um, because of these um, sort of bristles on the, the back of the calyx and the, um, the stems. And um, when I'm taking people for a hike who don't know this, um, they're always hugely amused when you just pick a little bit and you um, find somebody with a nice sort of woolly um, top and you stick it on there and you say, that's the poor man's corsage. 
<laughs> and uh, very effective. This, this grows, uh, unlike the baby blue eyes, which is uh, low growing in small plants, this grows as a rather sort of rambling uh, vine. Um, and you see huge quantities of it for a fairly short time in the sort of mid to late spring. Um, blue eye grass, well, um, uh, Bruce Delgado, who some of you probably know, um, thinks that this should be called the yellow-eyed iris. Um, and you can see exactly why he says that, because um, it's not blue, it's purple. Its eye is most certainly not blue, it's yellow. Uh, it's not a grass, it's an iris. But apart from that, it's not a bad name. <laughs> um, but th this is deceptive uh, in suggesting that the white um, variant is more common than the blue, uh, which isn't the case, but it's not uncommon. Um, but it has a relative, um, which you see down here, the golden-eyed grass, which is a, a glorious golden yellow, and you find in very damp areas. Um, I've only seen this by the coast. I hadn't seen this at Garland Ranch. But it's a nice little family. Um, Chia, um, I, I gathered that there are not many salvias um, in Santa Clara, which um, interests me. This one, I think, may be one that you do have. Saying up in San Mateo County, Santa Clara has the black sage. Right. Okay, but not, not the chia. The chia is around too. Oh, it is. The rocky spots. Yeah. Um, I, um, I got very frustrated last year because I saw it um, after it had flowered and not knowing one end of a plant from the other. I thought, well, I'll, uh, these are the buds, and if I wait a little while, it'll, it'll come out. So I went back a couple of weeks later, and it was over. Well, what I didn't know is it had been over for two months. But <laughs> anyway, now, now I know. Um, but she is a, um, a wonderful plant because the seeds um, have extraordinary nutritional properties. And it's said that the, the native uh, Americans would take a small handful of chia seeds and put them in their mouth, and that would be enough to sustain them for an entire day. Um, quite extraordinary, both, both food and, um, and liquid. Uh, it's a remarkable plant. Um, a vinegar weed um, you probably have here. Um, uh, you can usually smell it um, if it's a hot day before you see it, because it's a rather small, scruffy um, plant with sort of grayish green leaves. Um, but the flowers, when you look at them closely, are quite extraordinary. The, the flower tube does a complete U-turn there, and then the stamen pistils are uh, fused, uh, forming that sort of circle. Um, sometimes this is mistakenly called woolly blue curls, which I'm told you don't have here. And this is woolly blue curls um, that, that you tend to find in higher elevations. Um, ra rather different plant, though the same uh, genus, but very dramatic, a, just a, go a gorgeous plant. Um, and the brodeas, um, the dwarf brodea, um, ground hugging, not more than an inch or two high. Um, lovely deep blue or, or purple. And then the, the blue dicks, um, which having been separated from the family is now um, being brought back in to the um, uh, Trittalea family um, with the new Jepson. Um, totally different in its growth habit from the dwarf rodeo, multiple flowers, um, a long, completely leafless stem, and um, a few leaves um, I, I, I saw one leaf that must have been about that high, which was very odd. Um, normally, you, you don't see the leaves at all, just the stem and the, the flower. Um, sometimes confused, but they shouldn't be, with the, the gilias. Um, these are two common ones, the California gilia um, and the many stem gilia here. Um, Rod would disagree, but my observations um, suggest the leaves are actually very similar on the two plants. And that the easiest way to tell them apart is simply by the number of flowers um, in the inflorescence. The California gilia has um, between 8 and 25 flowers, and the many stem gilia has between 1 and 7. So if you see one with only a few flowers, you've either got a many stem gilia um, or you've got a very young California gilia, and I'm not sure where you go from there. But uh, they, they often grow together, um, so. It, it, it's very hard to tell the difference sometimes. The naked broom rape, um, this is a tiny little flower. The, the flower is probably not more than a oh, quarter to half an inch across. Um, and we found it for the first time this year. Um, 
And these photographs are rod, and they're far better than the ones I took, um, despite my best efforts. And these are fantastic photographs, given the size of the plant. Um, it's uh, parasitic on um, Asteraceae um, and also the saxifrage. And this particular one, um, we think, um, was um, using the saxifrage. Um, but it, it was a, a, a very remarkable find, because the flower is so tiny. Um, uh, larkspurs, we have um, three larkspurs um, at Gullen Ranch. This is the first one, the, the coastal zigzag larkspur. Um, very common, um, absolutely typical larkspur leaf. Um, and lovely um, blue, um, deep blue or purple color. And you notice the, um, the spur straight out, slightly up curving. If we go to the next one, the Paris Larkspur, um, this uh, one has a mm, still slightly upcurved spur, but very slight. But you can see the leaves are entirely different. There's a thread-like um, um, to linear leaves, very, very narrow. They often die out um, by the time the plant has certainly finished blooming. But they enable you to tell the difference between these two um, without any hesitation. Um, and a third one, this is not from Garland Ranch. Um, this one is from Sobranis Canyon, and just a little bit further south, the Hutchinson's Larkspur, which is endemic to Monterey and San Benito counties, um, and it doesn't go anywhere else. And um, this one, as you can see, has a downward curving um, spur and very, very broad sepals here. So blue blossom, uh, there's really no nothing to say about blue blossom. I'm sure you're all very familiar with it. This was an absolutely wonderful year for it. The, the display at Point Lobos was better than I've ever seen by a huge margin. Uh, um, and fantastic plant and wonderful smell. And um, Sharon tr tries to save me money by washing her hands with, with the flowers. If you just mix um, a little bit of water with the flowers, you, you make what I'm assured is extremely good soap. It just doesn't uh, package very well. Um, Chinese houses, uh, you know, I'm sure very familiar with. Um, this grows in very large quantities in Garland Ranch. Um, just a lovely flower. Um, and sometimes you have full apartment blocks, sometimes just sort of um, <laughs> uh, two, two family dwellings. And sometimes um, later in the year, they start looking pretty derelict. But, um, but when, they're, when they're in flower, they, they are uh, just gorgeous. Um, Birket Ariastrum, or one woolly star, um, is a much less common plant. This grows up on the higher elevations, um, usually um, in very dry, sandy areas. Um, it has these lovely little um, blue flowers and rather um, hairy bracts uh, here, which is, gives it its other common name. Um, for some reason, it seems to like uh, growing alongside the Douglas's fine flower. Um, um, the Stephanomerias, um, the, the three Stephanomerias we have, um, and these are very welcome late summer flowers when other things are really going over. Um, and you can spend many happy hours figuring out which one it is you're looking at, because they, are, they can be extraordinarily hard to tell apart. Um, this is the, the tall Stephanomeria. And the most obvious feature about this is the flowers of a sessel, or at best, subsessel. Um, this is not a very good picture, I'm afraid, but it's the best one I have showing the, um, the, um, the body of the fruit. Um, and this one is um, neither grooved, um, um, or sorry, it's, it's smooth and not grooved. If we go to the next one, the small stephanomeria. This has fewer flowers. <coughs> the, the, the number of petals on the flowers overlap, so that it's not a, um, a terribly good guide. But this one, you can see, if I'm getting the uh, um, terminology right, and please forgive me if I make technical um, errors. I'm almost bound to do it. But the, um, this has a, a clear pedicel, unlike the, the tall stephanomeria. And the fruit, you can see um, there are clear grooves on it, but it's smooth. And if we go to the next one, the Santa Barbara wire lettuce, 
This has many more petals, which distinguishes it absolutely from the small and with some confidence from the tall. But the fruit, you see, has grooves and is very rough. So if you're fortunate enough to see the fruits, you can actually tell much more easily than you can just from the flower. Um, honeysuckle really needs no comment. Um, tons of honey, hairy honeysuckle um, everywhere in Garland Ranch. Um, the, uh, which is obviously this one, um, the chaparral honeysuckle with the yellow flowers um, is much, much less common, but um, is, is found. Common snowberry, um, a lot of this, and the, the berries are interesting because um, it seems that the animals don't like the berries very much because they actually stay on the plant throughout most of the winter. Um, but if you open up a berry and look at it, um, the inside um, is almost like snowflakes. It, it's not solid. It, um, so the name isn't just from the color, it's also from the, the texture of the inside of the berry. Um, slender Fox. Um, I saw a, a picture of this in, on Rod's website, and I saw this huge pink flower. And I thought, how on earth could I have missed this lovely <laughs> pink flower? Um, and then I, I found it early this year. And I saw this tiny little thing like that, and I thought, now I understand. But um, it is a, a, a beautiful flower when you finally get to see it. Um, but good glasses are a help. Um, the round-leaf toyita, um, <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to be uh, skipping over a lot of the Fabaceae. I'm not going to talk about the clovers, although we've got a reasonable selection of them at Garland Ranch, but there's obviously a limit in what I can show you. But this is one... Um, that is um, interesting. It grows alongside stream banks, has these very distinctive um, three uh, rounded leaves and lovely um, dark pink um, flower heads, um, which are, you know, they can be that big. I mean, they're, they're a good size. And they're flowering at the moment. The Pacific pea, um, very common. Um, one of the things that we're always told about the Pacific pea is it's, it's the only member of the family that we have locally, at least, where the spent flowers actually stay um, on the plant. They don't just drop off. Um, with, with the others, they, they tend to drop off. Then we have two spring vetches, the, um, uh, or two um, vicious sativas, I should say, the spring vetch, which is this one, which, as you can see, has fairly broad leaves. And then there's the narrow leaf vetch with rather similar flowers. The flowers can be very hard to tell apart, but much narrower leaves. Um, because the trouble with saying broad leaves and narrow leaves is that half the fl plants you see have something in between. So <laughs> it becomes a little trickier. Um, the winter vetch is um, one of the, the most misnamed plants we have. I had no idea why it's called winter vetch, because it doesn't flower in the winter. It flowers in the summer or late spring, early summer. Um, unmistakable. Um, I mean, there's a relative that is um, rather hairier um, at the base of the flowers, but um, this is the only one we have at Garland Ranch, as far as I know. And finally, the, the giant vetch, which looks like a sort of downturned hand. Um, and the, the leaves um, are distinctive in that they get shorter as you go down um, the, um, the, the branch. So, um, the David Centauri, this is, this is the most beautiful little flower that grows usually um, fairly high up in, in dry places. Um, this is the, the normal color, um, lovely bright pink. Um, and then there's a white version, which is, is really very common. And as you can see from here, they grow closely together um, often in, in great um, numbers. Th this year has been a disappointing year for them, but last year was, um, was superb. Um, geraniums, I, mean, I don't need to spend time on the dove's foot geranium and the cut leaf geranium, which I'm sure you know very well. Um, but I did want to say a word about this one. I in the book, we call this Bicknell's geranium, um, because when we um, were putting the book together and trying to identify this flower, this Bicknell's was the only one that came close. Um, 
there was one oddity, which is um, the Jepson does say that it doesn't grow below 600 meters, but th there were no other contenders. And then I happened to photograph a, a flower that looked a bit like this, but slightly different at Point Lobos. And I thought, oh, th th this is a different one. So I went back to Calflora and I had a look, and lo and behold, I saw a geranium rotundifolium. I thought, this looks, this looks rather like it. Um, and the more I looked at it and looked at the plants in Garden Ranch, the more convinced I became um, that what we actually had was, was this, and not that it was geranium at all. And so I've, um, with, with all the appropriate permissions, of course, um, dug up a few plants and sent them off to the Department of Agriculture um, and said you know, what I was thinking um, and asked for their, their views. And um, to my delight, I got a reply back probably within two hours of the package arriving there, um, saying, yep, you're absolutely right, this is what it is. So um, it, it, it is this, and it grows in huge numbers in Garland Ranch, um, just everywhere. Um, and whereas these two are both fairly low-growing plants, this one grows, um, oh, six inches, um, even a foot high. So noticeably different. Um, fuchsia flower gooseberry, um, there are four kinds of gooseberries. We have um, the hillside, canyon, the fuchsia flowered, and the straggly. Um, the only ones that go on ranch are the, the fuchsia flowered, um, this one with the uh, very um, vivid red flowers and stamens, um, and the straggly gooseberry, which I'm, I'm not showing you, which has slightly different flowers. Um, the pitcher sage, um, very striking um, flowers on this. The leaves, not unlike the, um, the black sage, um, but the flowers, distinctively different. Um, ah, the, the elegant clark here um, has to be one of the most beautiful flowers um, we have. Um, grows in um, huge quantities on the hillsides and, uh, and on the flat. And th this is the typical color, but um, we find it in salmon pink um, and even pure white. And just a, a glorious flower. Um, the Lewis's clark here. Very strange thing about Calflora is that it doesn't have a single photograph of the Lewis's Clark here. Because the Lewis's Clark, I gather, is fairly uncommon in most areas. But it's far and away the most common Clark here we have in Garland Ranch. It is everywhere. Um, but a really beautiful flower, a little bit speckled, just at the base, not, not as many speckles as the speckled Clark here. Um, and it's a little bit hard to see in this light, but there's um, a reddish line at the base of each petal that forms a sort of square down, down there, and that's, that's quite distinctive. Um, and these drooping buds, also characteristic of the Lewis's Clark here, as the, buds, uh, sorry, as the buds mature before they actually flower, they tend to droop down. And um, this is a very strange beast, the um, uh, Clarke purpurea quadrivalnera. Um, because it comes in actually three different uh, versions. Um, there's this one, which has palish pink with a, a dark heart-shaped blotch on each petal. Um, then you have a deep maroon, which is this one, and it really, it, it doesn't, this doesn't do it justice. It really is a very, very deep, uh, rich maroon. Um, and then you find uh, ones that are just this color um, um, all over without the, the dark blotch. Um, but it's all the same subspecies. Um, our gilias, um, the slender flowered gilia, um, not not common, but it grows in a, a few areas, um, mostly on the on the flat, um, and is noticeable. Unfortunately, um, this line is distorting it, but it has a very very long um, tube there, which is very distinctive and a, and a deep purple throat. Um, this one here, I photographed at Fort Ord, the June gilia, um, is, I, I forget whether it's um, just rare or actually on the endangered list. Um, this, this is a very, very unusual um, species, uh, subspecies, but um, as you can see, um, same genus and species as the slender flowered gilia. Same sort of throat, um, but a, a deeper um, p uh, pink color. Um, and a, a very small flower, not more than about three or four inches high. 
Um, the, oops, sorry. Um, the purple spot gilly is, um, is a lovely one, um, a tiny little flower, um, not more than a quarter to half an inch across. And you've, you've got to get it early because as soon as the grass starts growing up, it hides the plant and you'll never, ever see it. Um, very distinctive with these um, purple spots inside the throat. Um, but uh, I, hate to, I don't know how many times life size that is, but uh, many, many times. Um, and then two others, the, the chaparral gilia um, grows in a variety of places, um, a, a pale throat, um, but the, the purple edges um, to the sepals that you can um, discern, um, and occasionally little purple blotches here, but just little ones. Not to be confused with the tricolor gilia, which has deep purple throat and these very large, very noticeable purple blotches <coughs> on the, the outside of the petals. So these two are immediately distinguishable. Um, California milkwort is a, a funny looking plant and it's really only worth mentioning um, because it is the, um, the only member of um, its family that grows in Monterey County. So it um, has no relatives at all. And as far as I know, it only grows in one place in Garland Ranch, but it, it does grow there consistently <coughs> um, despite the best efforts of the, um, the fire department who went down the trail where it grows with a huge bulldozer and destroyed almost everything, but um, thankfully it was still there this year. Uh, uh, Douglas' spine flower. Uh, this is a, it's a rather strange plant in, in a number of ways. It, it seems to grow in two distinct forms, as a very low-growing mat um, and on uh, quite tall stems, um, sort of six or eight inches tall, um, and it just depends where it's growing. On, in the open sandy areas, it seems to be more mat-like. And if it's among grassland, then it grows um, a bit taller. Um, but the, uh, um, you can see here the, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I don't know. It'll come back to me. Um, but you can see here that the, um, this is not the flower. The, um, the, the flower is here. Um, um, no. Oh, sorry. I did tell you I was an amateur. <laughs> the involucra. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, the involucra here um, uh, um, is the sort of the spines are held together by a sort of web. If, if we look at a, a relative, the, the Turkish rugging, we see the flowers are entirely different and you, you have quite separate petals. Uh, it's actually um, three large ones with three smaller ones in between the large ones. <coughs> and this only grows um, on one place and we collect it for our annual wildflower show and um, the docent who started the wildflower show is a wonderful guy called Gordon Williams, and he's, he's 87 now, um, and he still hikes everywhere, and he says, oh, you don't have to go far up this trail. Um, well, one of the other docents and I went up this trail last year, and it's one of the steepest trails in Garland Ranch, and we felt that we had to go almost to the top to find this wretched flower, <laughs> but it was worth like, finding. Uh, Red Maids really needs no comment. Um, a lovely deep pink flower, um, unmistakable, um, with a not uncommon white variant. Um, Scarlet Pimpernel, a bit like um, the Winter Vetch, um, totally um, inappropriately named. It's not scarlet. Um, this orange is the typical color. Um, pink is found occasionally, and we have this wonderful deep blue specimen that we find from time to time. And um, very conveniently, um, this grows um, best um, just on the edge of the parking lot. So you don't have to climb up these wretched um, mountains to find it. But it, it, it is an, an amazing color. Um, and the part of shoot, shooting star, well, um, you, you must have that up here. Maybe not this particular species. Um, this is the only species um, or subspecies that um, grows in Garland Ranch. Um, but it's very variable, this sort of rich pink, 
um, with these, the, the purple um, um, down at the base of the flower. Um, but it can be an even um, deeper maroon. It can be white. Or even, to, uh, this is a very curious albino specimen I found last year, um, which doesn't have any purple in it at all. Um, but it, we don't have quite such a fine display as you'll find at the pinnacles, but um, we still have some pretty good displays of this. Um, Starflower um, likes the, the redwoods, and we have um, some nice patches of it. Um, and is, oh, sorry, um, a good example of uh, why um, um, I, I tell people who know even less than I do, you shouldn't rely on the number of petals in a flower, um, because this could have six, seven, or even eight petals on the flower. I, th I think all these ones have six, but that's, um, that's uh, just happenstance. Um, Crimson Columbine, um, well-known, absolutely gorgeous flower, very rare in Garland Ranch. Um, I've never seen it um, there. These photographs um, are rods, and he took them two or three years ago and hasn't seen the plant since. Um, so I, I keep hoping. Um, and the roses, um, just um, we go through very quickly. The wild rose, of course, um, we all know um, with the... Um, the curved um, prickles and the um, persistent sepals um, on the hips. The, the wood rose um, are deciduous, so no sepals on the hips, much smaller flowers, and um, uh, anything up to nine leaves um, on each um, uh, petiole. And then the, the pine rose, not unlike the wood rose, but the only place I've ever found the pine rose growing in Garland Ranch um, happens to be on a particularly um, exposed, sunny trail. Nowhere near any pine trees, as far as I know. Um, but it's a, it's a deeper pink flower, um, much more sort of um, almost congested growth habit um, as compared to the wood rose, and never more than seven petals. So if you don't see, if you see nine petals on any um, leaf, sorry, nine leaflets on any leaf, you know you've got the wood rose, not the pine rose. Um, California fuchsia um, is actually much more red um, than, than this looks. It's a wonderful, um, very deep um, orange, almost um, scarlet. Um, the open flaring trumpet is very distinctive. It's sometimes confused with um, the scarlet bugler, but um, uh, this, as you can see, grows in a, a totally different way. And what I just skipped over there um, was one that Sharon and I found earlier in the year, um, the red larkspur. And this grows, uh, there are 11 plants of it on a, a rock. And as you're going across this trail, you are going down the trail, you cross a bridge, and then the trail goes around to the right, and this rock is straight ahead of you. And I took a, a group from the, uh, our local um, CNPS um, on a hike, and I told them about the red larkspur, and where it was, and I led them across the, um, the bridge, and I turned, they all followed me, and not one of them saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I did go back to show it. <laughs> um, but this, this is uh, unusual, not only in the um, very long spur uh, we have here, but um, the very, very broad um, leaves that it has compared to um, either of the others, or any of the other large spurs. Um, Ah, and the, um, another penstemon, um, the scarlet bugle, of course, the penstemon. This is uh, Grinnell's pe penstemon, which grows in the um, higher um, elevations above 1,800 feet. And this was up on Chew's Ridge on the way to um, the Zen uh, retreat at Tassahara. Um, and um, this, is, um, this is Corky Matthews, who some of you will know, who still leads hikes. And she's leading one up there next weekend. Um, absolutely wonderful lady. And she took us up this great long trail saying, I know there's an unusual pen steam and, um, up here. And we finally found it. And it had to be photographed by it. Um, and um, it's a, sort of a reddish purple. And um, nobody knows what species it is. It, it, they think it's probably a hybrid. Um, but nobody's been able to identify it. Um, sticky snapdragon. Um, 
I suspect you have up here um, quite a tall flower with um, long racemose um, spikes. Um, and then another snapdragon could hardly be more different. Um, the Kellogg snapdragon, only a few plants of this, as far as I know, in Garland Ranch, tiny little flower, um, and it grows almost like a vine that twines around other flowers. And at, at first, I thought um, this would be easily confused with um, the, the blue toad flax. But the more I look at the flowers, the more I see how very different they are. And of course, the toad flax has a um, completely different habit of growth, just little um, erect plants, um, and this very long spur um, that has at the back of the plant, whereas the snapdragon, of course, doesn't have a spur. So. Um, I learned a, a little bit with that. Um, the Indian warrior, um, one of the, um, uh, the hemiparasites um, in the, what was the Scrofulariaceae, um, and uh, as you um, all know far better than I, um, these and the Indian paintbrush um, and the owl's clover are all being moved um, to the broomery family um, to go with the other parasites. Um, but I, I had um, some pictures of this, um, and I thought, one day, one day I'd like to see the flower of the Indian warrior. And then I, th then I thought, well, let's have a look a little bit more closely. And it's not very easy to tell here, um, but this and that and here um, are all the flowers, uh, I d colored identically to the bracts. Um, and to the um, ignorant, totally invisible. Um, the owl's clover, um, we have um, three kinds, the, um, the pink owl's clover, the dense flower owl's clover, and the narrow-leaved owl's clover, um, all very commonly, um, and sometimes in, in large quantities. Um, and the um, Indian paintbrush, um, so I, I don't know why this is called the coast paintbrush, because this isn't the one you find at the coast. This is the one you find at the coast, the seaside painted cup. Um, and this is the one we find in Garland Ranch, um, which has much narrower bracts. These, as you can see, are very broad. These are really quite narrow. <coughs> the, the flowers um, are these tiny little um, extrusions here, um, and they're basically the same on, on both of them. Um, and the bee plant, um, the figwort, so you know, I hope none of you suffer from hemorrhoids, but if you do, here, here's, they say, your plant. Um, and that just proves that bees do actually like it. But um, I, I felt like saying to the bee, pick on somebody your own size. Um, the coyote brush, um, I mean, it's just common as muck um, in, in Garland Ranch and on the coast. Um, and I, I just included it um, just because the flowers um, were quite interesting, the huge difference between the, the female and the male flowers on this. Um, and looking at the male flowers, um, when I move on to the, the mule fat, you can see the similarity immediately. And the mule fat's quite interesting. There are only a few plants of this in Garland Ranch, um, and they, they grow by, right by the stream. But the, um, the stems of this tend to be uh, quite long and straight, um, and apparently they make extremely good fire sticks if you're trying to um, make fire um, uh, in the, the traditional way. Yeah. I haven't tried it yet, but um, I'm sure that's okay. <coughs> um, mugwort. Um, really, the only reason for mentioning mugwort is that um, it is um, supposedly um, a cure for poison oak. Um, but since poison oak grows in vastly large numbers in mugwort, you're better off avoiding it. Um, and California Everlasting um, and the Pearly Everlasting, I've, I've only included these two because um, with the aid of Mr. Jepson, um, I found what seems to be a foolproof way of telling the difference. And um, you have no idea how many people uh, can't tell the difference between Pearly Everlasting and California Cudweed. Um, but the, the leaves grow slightly differently. Um, but more obvious is the, um, both the upside and the downside 
of the leaves of the um, California everlasting or cudweed are green, where the lower surface of the polio everlasting is um, white and uh, definitely tomatose. And you, as soon as you, you see it, uh, it's unmistakable. Um, Coltsford, um, we have a, a lovely patch of this just at the bottom end of the Redwood Canyon. And we'd seen, the, uh, um, Sharon and I had seen the leaves many, many times as we were hiking up there. And we thought, what are these leaves? And finally, we figured out what they were just from the shape, which is unique. But we never saw the flowers. And then we found the flowers early in the year. And the reason we never saw the flowers was because they have seasonal footbridges across the creek, which they only put in in May. And by May, the flowers, of course, are finished. So what we found, we had to go um, down the Redwood Canyon the other way and then hike back out in order to see the flowers there, because the flowers come in um, March, usually before the leaves appear. Um, I, I, I did pick one of these leaves for the flower show just because I thought it was interesting. And um, what I found um, rather disconcertingly was that the leaf um, did not like being picked. It just wilted immediately. So that taught me something. Um, there are quite a few um, uh, Plagioboceros and Cryptantha in Garland Ranch. Um, very, very hard to tell apart. Um, some of them without looking at the, the nutlets under a microscope, and even then it can't, it's not always easy. This is the most common with its very distinctive um, rusty colored um, um, calyx. And th this grows in some areas um, in huge numbers. There's one field up um, by a, a pond which is just covered with the, um, the popcorn flower and the, um, the fiddle mix in the early spring, and it's a, it's a lovely sight. Um, the dogwood, um, very common along the, the creeks there. We have two kinds, the, uh, the western creek and the, the brown dogwood. Um, and the way we distinguish them is just fr from the leaves, the number of veins in the leaves. The brown dogwood just has three or four veins, <coughs> where this has, uh, as you can see, five or six or, or even more. Um, field chickweed. Well, I, I left out the other chickweeds, but I thought this was worth including just because it is such a beautiful little flower. Um, quite easily um, confused um, with the Douglas of Sandwort, but the, the way they grow is very different. And this grows, you can see, on m multiple stems, very spindly stems, they're tiny little flowers. Um, and the leaves disappear mm -hmm. almost entirely before the flower um, actually appears. Um, and the um, starwort, this, this is one that Rod um, likes to talk about um, with the, um, the, um, the five-part um, 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 this bit of the feminine anatomy up at the top, you know what I mean. Uh, but, um, unlike the, um, the spurcularia, um, which um, is only in threes, this one is in, in fives. And the windmill pink, um, I'm sure you um, have here. Um, and we also have this um, rather less common one, the lemon's catchfly, or lemon's campion, um, with um, either um, a, um, a, a reddish or um, a green bladder, and these extraordinary petals. Um, it, it's funny how difficult it is to see this flower. Um, it's, it's really very unobtrusive. You, it's, it's on um, banks, and it just sort of hides among um, the other vegetation. But it's, lo it's lovely when you see it. The wild cucumber, well, um, I'm sure you all know this, um, and how very different the, the feminine, the female flowers are with, with the fruit. Um, People in Monterey, I mean, you have to understand that Monterey really is you know, a long way away, and it's quite a, a lot further from civilization than you are up here in Santa Clara. So kids used to play games with these and then throw them at each other. And I thought this was great fun. Um, the, the more sophisticated kids, the ones who had actually been to a city, um, uh, knew that if they got hold of a dustbin, lid, then they'd have a ready-made shield. <laughs> um, Manzanita, um, we have 
quite a few manzanitas, um, nothing like as many as Fort Ord. I mean, Fort Ord, there are, I, mean, I, I don't know how many species, but a lot of different species there, and it's then just huge quantities. But we have the shaggy bark um, manzanita um, with its very distinctive um, bark, and, and the toro manzanita, which also has somewhat shaggy bark, so you can't just rely on that. Um, one of the features of this is um, the leaves all um, um, like to point up um, to the sky. Um, and this one, um, I believe, is, um, is also endemic to Monterey and San Benito counties. Um, the singing facilia, I'm sure you um, all know and love, um, or know anyway. Um, the common facilia, um, with its um, um, pinnate leaves um, and rather narrow um, sepals, um, commonly found, can be difficult to distinguish from the branching facelia, except in the, the way it grows. Um, then we have the imbricate facelia that um, is quite common in Garland Ranch with its very distinctive leaves um, and the flowers that just remain as sort of closed up um, tube almost. Um, and then this one um, is a fire follower. Um, and I photographed this up on Chew's Ridge last year. And as you can see, it was there in huge quantities. Um, and what Corky always likes to say about this is it has windows because the, the petals are um, just translucent, um, really quite distinctive. Um, this one supposedly is also a fire follower, um, but I, I found this in Garland Ranch um, a few weeks ago. And it, it wasn't um, an area that had been burned, but it was a, a landslip. A, bi a big tree had come down across the trail, um, and all the land, that all the soil that came down with it, um, spawned um, um, and this uh, rather lovely plant, um, and also the Kellogg snapdragon that you saw just um, a minute ago. Um, black sage, um, I gather, m uh, not so common here. It's everywhere in Garland Ranch. Um, <coughs> you just can't get away from it. Um, and an, another sage, you have a buena, um, which, uh, sorry? I'm, I'm sorry, another mint, um, um, which, of course, makes a very nice infusion. Um, and the leaves uh, just have a lovely scent. Um, fairy lantern. Um, do you, I imagine you have that up here? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, won't, I don't need to say any more about that. Um, but people are always surprised when I point out the, this single leaf just lying on the ground and say, where you see that, there's going to be a fairy lantern. They can't associate this rather um, scruffy leaf with this beautiful flower. Um, soap plant. Um, I mean, Sharon could t um, talk for hours about soap plant and um, all the various uses the native people made of it, from s um, stunning fish to making um, um, brushes um, from the, the fibers around the, the bulb. Um, but a, just a gorgeous plant. Um, Fat Solomon um, and um, Slim Solomon, um, of course you know, and the, the very different berries, um, these sort of, bl um, sort of mottled um, brownish red, and then these with the very distinct um, three stripes on them. Um, and uh, uh, fairy bells, um, this, this is one that always surprises people, um, the idea you have to lift up a leaf in order to find the flower, because all the, the flowers are only under the, le under the leaves, and then it has these rather nice um, orange or red berries later in the year. Um, and the narrow leaf flax, um, this has been a wonderful year for that. Um, we've had just hundreds and hundreds of them growing up um, in a flat area of grassland. Um, the white or just very, very pale blue. Um, and the Fremont star lily, um, beautiful flower, extraordinary seed heads that I just found. The, the seed heads all grow erect and they're about an inch long. Um, um, of course, not a great one to eat. So, um, and 
In the, the slide show we gave, um, or Rod gave, uh, to the um, Native Plant Society in Monterey, um, he had this listed as um, the elegant um, rain orchid. And Vern Yaden came up to him afterwards and said, that's not the elegant rain orchid, that's the Yaden's rain orchid. <laughs> and he pointed out the, the, the difference. And you can see it quite clearly here. You see that the, these almost like horns with the white, uh, the white edge, the green horns with the white edge. That is a characteristic of the Yaden's rain orchid and not the elegant. So this, this is clearly Yaden's. Um, and then we have the, the transverse rain orchid, where you see the, the spur um, just is um, horizontal um, like that, and very tall and slender. And then the Michael's rain orchid, um, which has um, not terribly easy to see on this picture, I'm afraid, but um, it has a very broad, sort of spade-shaped lower lip. That, um, so that and the color are quite characteristic. California plantain, we have um, lots of plantains, actually some of them interesting, and the only reason I mention this is because uh, I have a few pictures of plantains, and mostly it was because I was photographing something else and I didn't see that the plantain was there, it was so small. Um, but I thought that picture that actually has the stamens um, it really made a beautiful picture and shows how a very unpromising plant can actually be strikingly beautiful. Um, and the, the common Lenanthus, um, I'm pleased to see that the, the new Jepson um, now says that the throat can be not just yellow, but also purple or orange. Um, so you can see how here some of them are so dark purple as to be almost black, whereas here they're just pure yellow. Um, the, the existing Jepson um, says they all have to be yellow, which of course is thoroughly confusing when you see the black throated one. Um, the bicolored Lenanthus, um, um, quite a bit smaller, and this one does only have a yellow throat. Um, the Western Virgin's Bower, um, or Old Man's Beard, um, I, I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, there are a couple of different um, species of it um, around. This is one we have in Garland Ranch, and these seed heads do make a, um, a wonderful display. <coughs> um, the whoops, what happened here? Um, well, apologies for that. Um, never mind. Uh, California coffee berry um, um, is now a, a frangula, and it has these little sort of um, creamy, pale green flowers, and um, the berries that um, turn lovely dark black and have a very pronounced laxative effect. And as a doctor, Rod would um, counsel you not to overdo it on them because um, they could not only be very unpleasant, they could be positively dangerous. Um, and the spiny red berry, um, which we have in large quantities there, we have actually two red berries. We have the spiny and the holly leaved. Um, the spiny is far more common. Um, and sometimes it gets into really quite large bushes. And when you see those with all the berries, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful sight. And there's one that must be 10, 15 feet high. Um, it's, it's amazing. And <coughs> um, chemise um, is really worth mentioning only for the effect it creates when you um, see the whole hillsides um, covered in it. I mean, it's, a, it's a beautiful sight. Um, and toyon, another very common shrub, um, rather lovely um, little creamy white flowers. And the, the berries uh, give it its other name of Christmas berry or holly berry. And there's some suggestions that Hollywood was named um, um, after um, the Toyon because of the numbers that were growing up in the, in the hills above it. Um, and um, Cork is very, very insistent that um, this comes in two varieties. There's the ocean spray near the coast and the cream bush further inland. <laughs> um, but um, uh, they are, I believe, exactly the same species. <laughs> um, and the sticky sinkerfoil, um, sometimes confused with the California horkelia, or sorry, the leafy horkelia, this is. Um, but the, the number of stamens um, is a dead giveaway, 10 to 20 for the sinkerfoil, um, and never more than 10 um, for the horkelia. Um, the osso berry, or Indian plum, uh, flowers early in the year, these lovely um, 
clusters of um, pendulous flowers, little bell-shaped flowers, um, and then a berry um, that the um, Indians are reported to have eaten, um, but I've never eaten one, so I can't give any guarantees to the flavor. I, I'm told they're not actually particularly good. Um, but the wild blackberry, um, I just show this for two reasons. One is because it is such an extraordinary beautiful flower um, for such a, a, a common, not always welcome plant. Um, and this is a curious variant, and there's a, just a, a patch of them um, along one of the trails that have th these multiple petals. Um, and I kept on thinking it must be something frightfully interesting, so I sent some photographs of this to the same guy at the Department of Agriculture, and he came back saying, no, probably it's just an aberration. Um, so um, nothing exciting, terribly sorry. <laughs> but, um, and the thimbleberry, um, of course you know, um, the, the fruit is extraordinarily, extraordinarily difficult to photograph. Um, almost everyone I've encountered, I've eaten before I thought oh, I should be taking a <laughs> photograph of it. <laughs> um, or if I haven't eaten it, somebody else has. Um, the uh, small flowered alum root or coral bells, um, um, a hookera, um, doesn't grow everywhere, but not uncommon. But beautiful little flowers. A slightly different version of this, um, um, I think some Pilocissima grows um, in um, some other areas near the coast. And then um, a fairly close relative, the brook foam, has rather different, um, uh, almost bell-like uh, flowers. And this grows on the face of um, waterfalls. And we have uh, two waterfalls at Garden Ranch, one that actually has water on it um, and has this and one that um, almost never has water on it, except for a couple of days in the year, which also has this. Um, um, but it's, it's some way up, so I, I went over there with my 400 millimeter lens to try and get a photograph, and then really had to blow the photograph up, which is why this isn't um, terribly clear. Um, the woodland star um, and the, um, the hill star, um, often confused um, until one, um, People learn about the um, obconical um, hypanthium of the, the woodland star and the, the, the squared off um, one of the hill star. Um, in Garland, we, we find the woodland star, but the hill star is far more common. In Fort Ord, apparently, they have almost nothing but woodland star and almost no <coughs> hill star. It, so it, um, it, it depends entirely where you are. Um, California sacrosophage, um, obviously very familiar. Um, I'm not sure um, whether we can still call it sacrosophage now, but I suppose um, we can for the time being. Um, these two are um, often confused. Um, uh, the, the, whoops, sorry. Um, the the blow wise and the, um, the Europapus. But as you can see, the scales of these are uh, very different, and they're 10 scales, whereas there are only five um, on these. Um, and I have, I have still um, to see um, a Europapus in flower. I've seen the buds many, many times. I've seen the seed heads many, many times, and I still have never seen a flower. Um, this one I put in um, um, just to sort of lead into the other Asteraceae. Um, this was found up at Chew's Ridge, another fire follower, um, very rare, except after a fire, but it is such a striking plant. Uh, beautiful red rays, tiny little thin red rays, and striking deep orange disc flowers. And then another fa fire follower is this, the Rayless Arnica. Um, quite a retiring beast, this. Um, we, we had to search around in the undergrowth um, quite hard before we actually found it. Um, mock heather, I, I mentioned this not because the flower or the plant is particularly interesting, but it grows very differently by the coast and inland. In the coast, it's um, quite a low, very compact shrub. Um, inland, it grows you know, three, four, five feet tall, um, much more straggly and open in appearance. Um, but they are the, the same plant. Um, 
Golden Yarrow, likewise, is not a lot to say about this, except it's um, often confused with the lizard tail. And this is another one for the mathematically inclined, because if you count the, the petals here, the golden arrow has four to five, and the lizard tail has six to nine. So that should be a, a definite um, marker for which one you've got. You, you can see also they grow slightly differently. The, the golden arrow is taller with um, smaller, more compact flower heads. Um, the lizard tail um, doesn't have um, long um, peduncles, and the flower heads um, are a bit larger um, than with the golden arrow. The California gold fields, well, uh, we all know and love this, and there are one or two areas in Garland Ranch where we do get nice displays of it, not, not covering whole hillsides, but at least it's a whole meadow, so we, um, we feel honor is satisfied. Um, the telegraph weed, um, scruffy little plant for most of the year, um, but forms actually quite um, elegant um, um, plants in about sort of September or October, and we get some uh, nice displays of those along the Cooper Loop, um, which you can enjoy while you're avoiding the rattlesnakes. Um, I was uh, around there last year and uh, got talking with a, a guy, and he sent me um, an email later that afternoon saying, five minutes after we um, parted, I saw these two snakes on the trail, and he attached 17 photographs of two large rattlesnakes mating in the middle of the trail. I mean, absolutely stunning photographs. And while I, I had no wish to make the acquaintance of, of rattlesnakes, I would love to have seen that. Um, I'm not sure if telegraph we justifies that. Um, the tall layer, um, not uncommon, um, sometimes confused with the medias uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but the, the black spotted um, stem is quite distinctive. And the way the um, you have these. Um, I'm not sure whether these are leaves or bracts, but whatever they are, the way they immediately subtend the, um, the flower is, is very distinctive. Um, the woodland media, of course, uh, now no longer a media. Um, we, we have a few specimens of this, um, just, just one patch of them that I know, particularly in Garland Ranch. Um, very long ray flowers and quite a small center of disc flowers. And the leaves are opposite, um, quite a long way up, up the stem, which is distinctive um, compared to the other medias. Um, the slender tar weed, media gracilis, um, you can see very open habit of growth here, um, and only a relatively small number of flowers. Um, I think it's three to, three to nine flowers at most. Uh, the uh, media sativa um, has uh, more flowers, um, Eight, eight is typical, but it can be as many as 13. Um, interestingly, the current Jepson says, I think, um, eight to nine flowers, or seven to nine flowers. The new Jepson has upped the number to 13, which is a great relief because I saw several specimens earlier this year at Garland that had 13 ray flowers. And uh, for those who don't speak Latin, this is a very confusing one because, of course, you have another case, tarweed here, which is a um, completely different genus um, and species altogether. Um, grows very, very commonly by the coast, la large quanti quantities of it at Point Lobos, um, and several quite large patches of it in Garland Ranch as well. Um, and the, the, common oh, sorry. Um, the common media is one of the most confusing of all. Um, I'm very reassured that e even the new Jepson does say highly variable needs further study. <laughs> um, but you have these vivid maroon bases to the ray flowers here. Um, early in the year, you tend not to get that maroon base. It's, it's something that becomes more obvious as, as the year progresses. But with anything from 5 to 21 ray flowers, um, it's um, I mean, you, you can only admire it. I mean, you can't pin it down. Um, and there are um, very large numbers of this at uh, Garland Ranch. Um, <coughs> I include this um, uh, um, just because it's um, such an extraordinary flower with the, the very long um, sepals here. Um, and then the almost grass-like leaves. And I'm told that the, um, the root of this um, 
if you um, boil it, and um, Rod would give you a, a recipe, actually tastes a bit like oysters, which is um, how it gets its, its other common name. Um, common fiddle neck, um, very, very common, and you get some beautiful displays of this in the, in the early spring. Um, the rush rose, I, I love this plant. Um, the, it grows very much like a rush, um, almost no leaves on, on the stems, and has these really beautiful, delicate, um, brilliant yellow flowers. Um, quite a low growing plant, and not usually more than about two feet high. Um, and you find it up, up in the, the higher elevations on these sort of sandy trails. Um, um, the lance leaf dudleya, um, this is um, far and away the most common dudleya that we have, a uh, garland ranch. Um, I don't know whether we have um, dudleya samosa, we probably do, um, but this is the, the most common one with the, um, the very much taller, um, sort of 12 to 15 inch long um, stems. Um, the mariposa lily, well, what can I say? Um, for our flower show, the, the powers of bee produce this lovely poster, um, um, beautifully designed with a, a picture of a glorious mariposa lily. Um, unfortunately, they chose the butterfly um, mariposa lily, which grows in large quantities at the pinnacles and has never been seen at Garland Ranch. <laughs> <laughs> but this one is, and um, it's a beauty. Um, um, the pretty face, uh, um, another trichelea, um and this has been a fantastic year for it. I, I've never seen so many as we've seen this year, just, just everywhere. Uh, ab absolutely beautiful little flower. Um, and the contorted primrose, um, very small, um, lovely little um, typical primrose or camisonia flower. But the really striking thing is how the stems get so contorted um, later on um, in the year. It's, uh, the, just some amazing things. Um, and it's, it's relative, although it's now been put into a different genus, um, the small primrose. Um, slightly smaller flowers. The flower is basically very similar. Um, but what you'll see, these leaves are a little bit hairy. But these ones um, you know, um, have um, you know, some, some serious growth. Um, uh, cream cups, uh, another um, a beautiful flower, um, a, a poppy, um, lovely, lovely bowl-shaped um, flower before it opens up. And when it opens up, you can see the, the white um, petals with a yellow base, um, which is, is sometimes confused, which shouldn't be with um, the, uh, the mechanella, where, oh, sorry, um, where you have alternating yellow and white flowers, and the yellow comes all the way out um, to the edge on, on the yellow petals. Um, California poppy, well, um, everyone knows and loves this. Um, and of course, um, this little receptacle down here, very characteristic. Um, I, I imagine you have the tufted poppy up here? You do? Yes, no, maybe. Um, but this, uh, you, you can distinguish this because there's no receptacle. Um, the, the flower itself looks very similar to the California poppy, but if you look underneath and uh, you see no receptacle, then uh, you know it's, it's something different. Um, prickle fruit buttercup, and buttercups are not the most um, interesting plants visually, but uh, this is a, a, a slightly funny one. The um, petals clearly divided, and uh, only um, five of them, but the fruit, um, you can see up here how it gets its name um, with the marked spur and then these sort of, um, what looks like a hairbrush on the side of them. Um, quite, a, quite a low growing plant, um, much lower than the, the normal buttercup. Um, sticky monkey flower, well, of course, and this grows everywhere. And uh, Does it grow everywhere up here? Yeah. yeah. But, um, but do you get this one? No. Ah. <laughs> Um, uh, there, there are two plants of this in Garland Ranch, um, one on top of a ridge, but the other, which is extremely useful to us when we have the flower show, um, grows um, about uh, 50 yards from one of the parking lots. 
Um, um, not such a good specimen, but um, um, it is there. And it's hard to see in this light, but the edges of the lobes of the flower are actually white. And the flower is clearly more apricot colored compared to the really bright orange of the sticky monkey flower. Um, Johnny Jump Up, well, we had lots of this, and uh, it's a lovely plant. Um, and there are <coughs> lots of explanations for why it, it got its name, um, which may or may not be true. Mm -hmm. Like Johnny Jump Up and Kiss Me, but um, I don't know. Um, the checker lily um, grows only for very, oh sorry, flowers for, for, for a regrettably short period in the early spring. We just have a few places where it grows and it's just a, a joy to see um, when, it, when it does appear. Um, the giant trillium, um, we have a lot of this, a garden branch. Um, and interestingly, we um, have very little of the, um, the other one who's... Um, Names slipping my mind. Um, Old sorry, the uh, no, not white. Um, there's another common name for trillium. Um, uh, the wake robin. Sorry, thank you. The, the western wake robin. Um, um, there's a lot of it um, just a few miles away from Garland Ranch, in, a, in an area that has both the western wake robin and the giant trillium. But in Garland Ranch, we only have the giant trillium, but we do have a lot of it. This is a very unusual picture of it because it likes the shade so much you almost never see it with sun on it. Um, the hellebore, um, Epipactis hellebrine, um, not a lot of it at Garland Ranch. Um, these photographs were actually taken um, um, where we live from along one of the holes in the golf course on the edge of the river. Um, it, there's an, a, large numbers um, of, of these um, the, the ones that go on ranch um, tend to get knocked over by some vandal before they actually come into flower, which is a great pity. Um, the many fruited meadow roof, um, quite a lot of this when you know um, what to look for. Um, quite distinctive leaves, which don't really come out in this picture, but these lovely flowers with the very long and many, many stamens. Um, and then the, um, the um, dioecia, so these are the female flowers or, or fruits. Um, and you can see in a little bit more detail how the fruits develop. Um, and the small burnet, um, I've included, uh, this was actually brought over by the English apparently because they valued its leaves um, in salads. I, I've tried eating the leaves and I must confess that um, I think that um, culinary tastes have developed over the centuries. <laughs> um, but if you see it in flower, um, it, it's really quite beautiful. And um, you can just see one or two tiny little bits of red. Um, it's often covered in um, little fuzzy red flowers um, before these um, sort of thread-like filaments appear in such quantities. So it's really rather lovely um, early in the year and then very dull later. Um, so this is a, a, a fond run. This, this we found um, just a few weeks ago. It was actually found by um, one of the park district employees called Joseph Narvaez. And he sent me an email saying, I, I saw this interesting plant. I think it may be a coral root. What do you think? Um, and I said, yeah, it's a striped coral root. And I did a little bit more digging. And it turns out it's never been officially recorded in Monterey County before. Um, um, since uh, this has become sort of more widely known, a few people have come up to me and say, oh, yes, I have seen it this in other places. So we can't claim that it really is the first one, but it's the first officially recorded one. Um, and uh, quite common in Santa Cruz County, but not as far south as Monterey. Um, and then in, in honor of um, Rod Yeager, he likes to end his sh um, show saying, um, I always hate to end in a rush. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Oh, hello. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for a lovely presentation. Uh, I want to remind everyone we have Michael's book available at the book table with Ingrid. Please get your copy, and Michael is open to signing it if you like. <laughs>